This is Tuesday, June 4th. There are 43 days until San Diego Comic-Con 2019. Welcome to SD Concast, the official podcast of the San Diego Comic-Con unofficial blog. Good evening. I'm your host, James Riley, and joining me on the podcast tonight, Carrie Dixon. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Also joining us, Aaron Tapkin. Hello. Thank you for having me back. And our first special guest of the evening, William Stout. Hi, how are you doing? Is there something I need to click to make my face big or, to, nope. or is it automatic? It, just, it pops up when you talk, so you're, right. it should pop up then. Um, joining us later in the show will be uh, distributor and uh, comic publisher Bud Plant. Um, okay. But for now, this is just our special interview-only episode, so news, exclusives, and et cetera will be going... Uh, on our podcast tomorrow. We'll be taking comments and questions for both uh, William and Bud throughout the show. You can tweet us at SD underscore comic underscore con or use the hashtag SD concast. We will also be keeping an eye on the YouTube live chat if you wish to comment there. Uh, all right. So, uh, Carrie, why don't you kick it off? All right. So, William, uh, first of all, for anybody who doesn't know you, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, on the way to Los Angeles. I pretty much kept an L.A. base my entire life, even though I've lived all over the world. And I'm an artist, and I've worked in just about every field of art there is, from uh, designing motion pictures to designing mm -hmm. theme parks to comic books uh, to painting murals. I did murals. Uh, if you're down in San Diego for Comic-Con, you can go visit the 12 murals I painted for the San Diego Natural History Museum and the two I painted for the San Diego Zoo. I uh, also do album covers, and so it's been a pretty diverse career. Which is awesome, yeah, and I mean, we love a lot of your work. So you are actually one of the special guests for Comic-Con this year, and it's also the 50th year, which is obviously a very big year. What does it mean to you to be a special guest this year, being that it is like such a momentous year? More panels than I've ever done before in my life. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, uh, one of the reasons I'm a special guest is I, I w was made a special guest two years ago permanently because I'm one of only four people who's been to every single Comic-Con. I was, Which is incredibly impressive. Yeah. The first one was very different from the way Comic-Con is now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got a sleeping bag and I slept on one of the fans' floors in his bedroom and it was very casual, very casual. I think there's still some of that going on now, isn't there? People sleeping on other people's floors. Well, there is that, but I don't think the guests do that anymore. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, the guests that were first here were me, Jack Kirby, and Mike Royer. And we got mm -hmm. up on stage. We, they had big easels for us, and we did what are called chalk talks, where uh, a person in the audience would yell out, draw Thor. So Jack would draw Thor, tear the sheet off, and give it to the kid. Draw Tarzan. I'd do a Tarzan, tear it off, and give it to whoever asked for that. It was very uh, fun and casual. Yeah, you can't get that much at uh, Comic Con these days. Not not free Jack Kirby drawings. That's for sure. No. No. <laughs> yeah. no nothing. Almost nothing casual about Comic Con anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, we were going to ask you about what it was like in those early years, but that sounds like it was. Is there any other like uh, um, stories from the early years about how? As it, as it shaped through in the 70s and became what it is um, that you could see as it was going that direction? Well, it's, when it started out, it was just uh, a handful of guys with box, cardboard boxes full of 25 cent comics. It took uh, a few years before the first girl to arrive. Uh, now it's, it seems it's about 50-50, male, female. So that, that's a welcome change. And it used to be in hotels rather than at the convention center. So that was a whole different atmosphere there. Yeah, conventions and hotels definitely have a different flavor to them than uh, convention center. It's uh, more party-like, much more party-like. Yes, definitely. Especially, uh, Aaron, especially oh. after the dealer's room closes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, party floor. Yeah. So you, um, you mentioned that they now have you be a permanent guest now that you're one of the the last people that have been to all 50. Uh, so 
How many times before that did they have you um, as a special guest? Oh, gosh. Uh, it was usually about every five or six years. Oh, wow. So you're, so you're used, used to that. I love it. It's Good. great. And you also won um, way back in 1978, I think it was, you won one of the Ink Pot Awards? Yes, I did. That was, that's one of my uh, mm -hmm. proudest awards. It was presented to me by Jim Storenko. So, oh, really? And, yeah, that was pretty cool. He's going to be there this year, right? <laughs> Is he going to be there this year? I think, I think so. so. I, yeah. I, I think I remember mm -hmm. seeing, seeing him mention that. Well, they're, they're, they're I can't yeah, imagine right. it ever gets old being being a special guest and and being treated treated like Comic-Con royalty, which you clearly <laughs> are. Well, going to Comic-Con itself never gets old. It's uh, it's sort of different mm -hmm. every year, really. There's, there's things that stand out, uh, remarkable mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that really tickled me is my mm -hmm. dear friend Ray Bradbury was on a panel at Comic Con, and he was mm -hmm. a regular attendee as well. And his, they said we have time for one last question, and a kid raised their hand and said, "What do you want to do more than anything in the world?" And Ray said, "I want to go over to Bill Stout's booth and look at his pictures." So that when I heard that, I was just so tickled and so excited. It was it, what a compliment. Seriously. Um I forgot the question I was going to ask, so I have one prepared. Um, so you're going to get, most likely, as most special guests do, a panel that's all about you. Um, you know, a spotlight on kind of a panel. Um, how do you approach panels like that? Do you do you make it like introduction to William Stout, or do you just go with a full Q&A and just whatever people want to know, or do you have something prepared? I, I have something prepared. I have a uh, PowerPoint show uh, with about... Oh, about 180 images that sort of span my career. And I just informally talk about my career, how it started, how it progressed, what changes came, what different areas I've worked in, and the pictures help to support that. So it's a, a fairly lively show. And it's different every time because I, I don't read it. I don't do it from notes. It's all spontaneous. Okay, cool. Well, like you said, every year is a little bit different. So having attended 50 years beyond that Rick Bradbury moment, do you, is there like a moment that really stands out to you in those 50 years? Well, there there is. In the year 2000, uh, Comic-Con hosted the very last major EC comic book reunion. And they invited every living EC comic artist to come to the show as a guest. And I worked on Little Annie Fanny in Playboy with Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder. And so I was assigned the task of uh, taking care of Will Elder while he was at the banquet. Now, when I was working for Christman and Elder, I worked very closely with Willie, and we developed a, a wonderful relationship. He was very fatherly. I mean, he started out when he was a young guy. He was pretty crazy. He did some insane stuff that Harvey used to tell me about. But by the time I met Willie, he had, he'd very mellowed out and stuff. But one thing that really impressed me was uh, one day he asked me to give his son the drug talk. And I was, I was so honored that he trusted me with that. Uh, I, I've never forgotten. It really meant a lot to me. And as I said, he was, he was very fatherly toward me. Well, at Comic-Con, we were at the banquet, and it was a buffet style, and Willie had finished his plate of food, and he wanted to get a second helping. So I said, Willie, let me help you. By that time, he was, he was pretty frail. And so I, I held him, and we slowly started walking towards the uh, banquet table. And suddenly he stopped, and he looked up at me. He said, Bill, now you're my dad. And my heart just melted. It just melted on the spot. That's lovely. So it's a very good memory. Yeah. I've, I've never gotten a memory like that at any other convention. It's, it was just so special. That's awesome. Well, one of the, one of the uh, hot button topics that often surrounds people talking about SDCC is what's changed. And some people say that the changes aren't always for the better. So I was wondering what you thought about the evolution of, of Comic-Con throughout the years. Well, uh, some of it's been for the better and some of it hasn't. Uh, one of the things that disturbs a lot of people I know is that it's not as much about comics as it used to be. It's more about film and television. 
To remedy that, though, uh, Comic Con started San Diego Comic Fest, which is strictly comics, and it's one, become one of my favorite shows of the year. It's a fantastic show. Uh, but there are still comic elements to Comic Con, especially so with the gigantic craze for comic book movies, like the Marvel movies and the DC movies. It's just, boy, it's, it's sort of taken over our culture. Absolutely. That's which, true. Uh, speaking of movies, you've actually worked on some movies over the years, including being, uh, I think you were a head of design on something like Masters of the Universe. Um, but That's correct. How is, how is that work? different than actually just sitting down and drawing something, you know, creating art just for the art's sake, but actually producing it for another medium? Well, I've worked on 45 feature films uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of different capacities. Started out as a storyboard artist on Conan and ended up, up becoming the production designer of Return of the Living Dead, Masters of the Universe. And uh, I know doing storyboards for films is very similar to doing comics except that there's there's more rules well for one thing uh the panel size never changes in a film <laughs> the uh and uh there's something called crossing the axis which you can never violate if characters are moving from left to right you have to keep them consistently moving from left to right you can't suddenly place the camera on the other side of them and shoot them because it'll look like they suddenly turned around and are running back to where they came from so but that's something that you don't encounter in comic books. You can do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, it's it's a much more of a team effort than comics. Uh, with comics, you can write, draw, letter, color your own book all by yourself if you want to. Uh, but uh, it'd be very difficult to make a major feature film doing that. And so uh, I have to rely on really fantastically talented people. When I'm a production designer, I generally have about 1,250 people working under me. It's uh, primarily a managerial position. And the only time I really have to do the designing of the film is on Saturday and Sunday. So it's a job that's 18 hours a day minimum, seven days a week, uh, often. Uh, well, it used to be every January, I'd get five to seven film offers and I'd try to figure out which one I wanted to do the most. But picking one, I knew that it would mean uh, that for at least one year, if not two years, I would not see my family. The only time I would see them is when they're asleep because of the hours that I would keep on the film. So that's a pretty tough decision. Is it worth it to give up seeing your, your boys, your sons grow up uh, for a movie? And most of the time, no. Especially since there's no guarantee that the movie is going to be fantastic or it's going to be great. So that, that's always, that was always a tough decision to make. I found it much easier to do quick in and out work, like designing a creature for a film. For instance, I designed the big bug at the end of uh, Men in Black. And so stuff like that, that usually only takes about two or three weeks. And uh, it's nice. I get a film credit, and I have that magic answer. When people come to see me at my Comic-Con booth, what films have you worked on lately? I can, I can tell them which ones I did. And strangely, it validates me in their eyes because film is the current uh, coin of the culture of our times. Well, speaking of film, uh, one of our readers actually had a question for you. As you right. mentioned, you worked on Return of the Living Dead. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like and what you contributed to the film? That was the hardest movie I ever did. It was a low-budget film, and I had... I had to answer to two people in key power positions, the director and the producer, and they didn't always see eye to eye. So I had to figure out who actually had the real power, who to listen to, and try to keep from being ground up between these two guys. Uh, the film itself, I'm really proud of. It really holds up well. Every time there's a screening in LA, it sells out in minutes. Uh, we had a fantastic cast, and it's one of the extraordinary things about that film for me. It's the only motion picture I've ever worked on where I'm still really good friends with the cast. And that's because Dan O'Bannon, the, the writer and director, did a wonderful thing. He gave us a wonderful gift of two weeks of rehearsal prior to shooting. And that was to make the cast feel like, at the end of the two weeks, that they really did know each other, that they really were old friends. And because the film hadn't been completely cast yet, I got to read the parts that hadn't been cast. And so I was there at the rehearsals and the readings every day. And uh, we're all... Fantastic friends. Most pictures, you're friends during the film, and then you never see those people again. But I've kept in touch with all the Return of the Living Dead cast. They've just been fantastic people to know. 
That's awesome. Well, to shift gears here just a little bit, you mentioned earlier that you have done some amazing murals for the San Diego Natural History Museum in, I believe, 2007. How does something like that actually come about? Is it a project? Like, just how does how does that happen? Well, uh, originally I was up for two murals at the Smithsonian, but because I didn't have the samples to back up my desires, it, it went to another person. Uh, I still was really dying to do murals. One of my favorite artists in the world is Charles R. Knight. Charles R. Knight is the man who visually defined dinosaurs for the rest of the world. It was his dinosaurs that they used for King Kong. It was his dinosaurs they used for Fantasia. Uh, if you go to the American Museum of Natural History, he did the murals there, the dinosaur murals there. He did the dinosaur murals in Chicago at the Field Museum of Natural History, and he did our La Brea Tar Pit mural uh, here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So one of the things that intrigues me about murals is it's big uh, it's it's not just small handwork it's it's big arm work and also you're creating art that is going to live long after you're gone uh, it's a real artistic legacy so that that's another reason i really love murals plus they use all the different talents i've acquired as an artist you have to know how to paint landscapes you have to know animal anatomy uh you have to know color and design it, everything comes into play with murals and it's fantastic. Plus, they're on public display. And so I, I love to watch the public interact with the murals. Uh, one of the paleontological advisors I used on the San Diego mural, after the murals were finished, she loved to sit sort of uh, in the background and watch people interact with the murals. And she was watching one little old lady looking up at my big uh, mammoth mural. And she'd look at it, and she'd get a little closer, and then look at it, and then get a little closer. And finally, she got just a few inches from it, and she shrieked. She said, oh, my God, it's a real painting, because it's so rare nowadays to see murals that are real that are not digital blow-ups of something. And so these are yeah. all hand-painted, oil on canvas. And, uh, I would, boy, it's, if I could do murals for the rest of my life, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. That's my favorite kind of work. Murals and comics, those two things are just incredible. But uh, those mural opportunities don't come up very often. Usually there has to be a change in the building or, or an ad added wing or, or some new display that they need to make permanent. So, so what happened was in the mid-1970s, I joined the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. That's the group of scientists that study dinosaurs. And anyone who would care to listen, I would tell them, boy, the one thing I love doing more than anything is painting murals. And that eventually paid off because uh, Lynette Gillette, who is uh, a paleontological advisor at the San Diego Natural History Museum, she gave me a heads up. They said, we're building a new prehistoric hall here called Fossil Mysteries. Uh, and so because of that, I contacted the museum and I offered to do a free lecture on the importance of murals, basically stating that whether you hire me or not, this is why you should have murals in your institution. And I also brought along some sample pieces. Uh, Lynette had told me what the dinosaur murals would consist of as far as species. And so I did a really quick uh, mini mural of that because I wanted to show that my murals were not going to be boring. They were going to be lively with animals doing all kinds of things that are natural to them. Plus, I wanted to show that the murals are going to be filled with juicy color as well. They're going to be really colorful. They were not going to be dull in any way. And I brought along a big, huge uh, plein air landscape that I had done of Eaton Canyon to show that I was already familiar with the uh, Southern California landscapes and could, could paint them well. Little did I know that the staff there that gathered to hear my talk were all huge plein air landscape painting fans. And so that uh, went a long way to cementing uh, me as the guy chosen to paint the murals. Can you talk a little bit or tell us a little bit about what you love about about that era? Because you, you clearly, you must love that era because you depict it so well. So can you, can you tell us just a little bit about that? Oh, sure. When I was three years old, uh, this was before anyone in our neighborhood had televisions. My mom and dad took me to see my very first movie. It was at the Reseda Drive-In, and it was a re-release in 1952 of the original 1933 King Kong. That's the first movie I ever saw. I think it did damage at a genetic level. I've been nuts about dinosaurs ever since. And not long after that, I saw the Rite of Spring sequence from Fantasia, and man, that was it. It's been dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs ever since. I, I just love those creatures. The fact that you can 
see these fantastic creatures, but actually visit their actual skeletons is just extraordinary because they were real. It's not like dragons. Dragons didn't really exist, but these creatures did, and you can visit visit them at museums. Um, so in addition to that awesome work, you've also done some awesome work for Mondo over the last few years. Yeah. Including the Comic-Con print from a few years, uh, King Kong Comic-Con print from a few years ago, Metropolis poster that actually is behind Aaron. Right. And uh, yeah, a, I'm wearing too. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, like a Ch Ch uh, Chthulhu tiki mug. How do you approach uh, that different kind of uh, commissioned work? Uh, and how is it working in those kind of mediums versus print? Well, wow. well, for those who don't know what Mondo is, they started out as part of the Alamo Draft House, which is a, a uh, chain of theaters that showed great old movies. And every once in a while, they couldn't get the original poster for the film, so they'd hire a local artist to do a poster just so they'd have something to put in the marquee. Well, the public started going, hey, I love that poster. You want to sell it? Well, now that's their main business is they hire top contemporary illustrators to do brand new movie posters for old classic films, which is sort of ironic because now illustration and movie posters for contemporary films is almost non-existent. That disappeared uh, with the advent of Facebook. And so for me, the, the thrill and excitement of being able to do a movie poster for say my favorite film, King Kong, boy, it's irresistible. And what they do is uh, they hire artists to do the posters and they issue the posters as limited edition silk screen prints. They get these incredible posters printed up in Seattle by, by a great silk screen people. And so it was King Kong that was my first, and I've done uh, White Zombie, Nosferatu, Metropolis, and as you mentioned, I've gotten into the three-dimensional collectibles with the Cthulhu mugs. I'm also doing similar things for Sideshow collectibles. I'm hoping uh, that this year's Comic-Con will debut the piece figure that I designed, which is based on the poster I did for the movie Wizards. And uh, they are also doing a huge book called Dinosauria, uh, which is based on all their dinosaur sculptures. It's going to be a gorgeous, gorgeous color photo book of all their their dinosaur sculpts. And they contacted me and they said, we would love to have you do your version of one of our dinosaurs. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, well, how many dinosaurs do you have in the series? They said, 18. I said, let me do all 18. So I did 18 brand new dinosaur pictures that will be included in the book Dinosauria. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we love, I, I love Sideshow. I, I love going on there on Sunday and having a few hours there just to walk around their booth and take pictures of all their statues and, and figures and everything that they have uh, showing off each year. Oh, they're the best at what they do. They're really amazing. And they do not rest on their laurels. They're constantly striving to make their work better and better and better. Every time I visit, they've made some new breakthrough. They're just incredible and super nice people too. Hey, yeah. Aaron, uh, Night Bodega in our chat is asking, will you show off that Tiki mug again? Yeah, absolutely. This is the uh, oh, Cthu yeah. carafe of Cthulhu. This is the um, one of the the glaze on it is actually a, uh, the Mondokan exclusive glaze. It's a, it's a bone glaze, I, guess, I think is what they what they call it. Right. And yeah. It's turn it around here. Sold out in about two hours, I think. That's and a good that's another thing about Mondo is they got this unbelievable sales team. When I did the King Kong poster, they said, we like to debut our most important posters at, at major events. So we're going to debut your King Kong poster at Comic-Con this year. So be at our booth on Saturday at 2 o'clock. And I said, great. They said, yeah, we'll be opening up the packages of prints, and you can sign them right there, and we'll be selling them. So I went over at 2 o'clock, and uh, just the Mondo people were there, and I sat down and started to sign prints. And my assistant said, oh, my God. God, have you seen the line? And I looked over, I said, there's no line. Holy cow. As far as the eye could see, there was a line to the Mondo booth. They had sent out an instant Twitter blast to all 130,000 Comic-Con attendees that the new King Kong poster was debuting that I was signing. Them. And boy, those sold out in two hours. That's great. That's the great thing about Comic-Con. You can just announce it. And then all of a sudden, there's, there's a few thousand people waiting to buy something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And happy to do so. 
That's great. Okay. Uh, well, we have how many more minutes? We have we have a, plenty of time. It looks like. Uh, so, Aaron, yeah. I think you had another question. Yeah, I I do have a question. I I hate to bring bring the tone down a, uh, a little bit, but um, the SDCC community um, has and the Comet community have suffered some heavy losses in the past year, including Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, and even the Comic Con president uh, John Roger Rogers. Um, one of my <laughs> favorite things about you and your um, your journal online is your ability to memorialize and pay tribute to the people that you have known and the people that you respect and the people that you love. And I was wondering why you think paying tribute like that is, is so important. I think it helps to keep the memory of those wonderful people alive. And plus having uh, become friends and known a lot of them, I, I, I think it's valuable to share personal experiences that really humanize these people. Uh, Harlan Nelson is another guy we lost recently, um, just a very, very dear friend of mine. And the, the great thing about Harlan, though, is that he has done so many YouTube videos that whenever I miss Harlan and, and really long to talk to him, I'll go to YouTube and I'll watch a few of his videos. Because when I was with Harlan, it, it wasn't so much of a conversation as Harlan holding court. And so it, it feels like I'm in his presence and he's sharing some of his favorite stories with me. So that's terrific. But yeah, boy, we lost some big ones. Uh, Steve Ditko was really important to me. He was, it was funny. The very, my, when I was hired to work on Annie Fanny, they flew me to New York. And my very first day in New York, the first thing I did is I walked into a phone booth. I, if, I'm sure we'll probably have to explain what phone booths are to contemporary kids. But I walked into a phone booth, I opened up the phone book and looked up Steve Ditko's name. It says Steve Dick or Ditko Steve Artist. And I, I didn't have the courage to call the guy uh, and because part of it was I respected his privacy and I, and I had heard he was a notoriously private person. But just seeing his name in the phone book was like, yes, he does exist. He's a real guy. And uh, boy, he's just, he's, he's one of those true comic book greats. You know, when he was doing Doctor Strange, uh, a lot of people after him who did Doctor Strange, they would do wild pages where they all the panels would uh, make a big face or something. Steve Ditko in these little square panels would take you to the weirdest places in the world. It almost felt like you were tapping into his spine or something. It was just the stuff was so weird and so out there. And uh, I don't think anyone's even come close to him yet when it comes to drawing Doctor Strange or, or even Spider-Man. So is there anything that you can tease for this year's Comic-Con? That I can tease? Mm-hmm. Well, I've, what do you I've got always, going on this year? <laughs> well, actually, I've got a huge new poster that's going to debut at Comic-Con. I did it for one of the founders of Mondo, Justin Ishmael. Wow. And it's a poster of Kong Skull Island. And wow. my wife, who's my harshest critic, she thinks it's one of the best pieces I've done. So if she says that, then then I know I've got a winner. So I'm, I'm very excited about debuting that at, at Comic-Con. It'll be the centerpiece of my booth. Nice. That'll, that'll be amazing. Yeah. yeah. I can't and, wait to see that. Yeah. And of course, this will be the first Comic-Con that I'll have copies of Fantastic Worlds, my big art book. It's a over 300 pages, over 500 images, and it covers my entire 50-year career as, a, as an artist, and I'm, I'm really proud of it. Inside Editions did an amazing job with the book. It's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book, and uh, they even did something, this is a little technical, but they did something that I didn't ask for, but I know was really expensive. It's called spot varnishing. Over every single piece of art, there's a varnish coating, and they had to, spot varnishing is usually done uh, the plates are done by hand and wow it just adds a whole extra uh, class to the presentation of the pictures it's just wonderful and that book really touches is only the tip of the iceberg of my career and what i'm doing now is uh, i'm planning a multi-volume autobiography and each volume will be about a different aspect of my career the first volume is already out it's prehistoric life murals uh, john flesk published that flesk publishing and uh, he's going to do my next volume, which is going to be collect all of my comics work. And it'll be about the same size as Fantastic Worlds. It's, uh, the text alone comes to over 120 pages. And wow. 
Uh, I'm also just finishing up a book on all my music related art as well. So each of those chapters in Fantastic Worlds will give you a taste of what's coming. And uh, there will be big books on each of those chapters. There'll be a huge book on just my film design, a huge book on just my entertainment advertising. So I'm excited about that. The book that John wants to do most with me is the book that I think will probably be the most important book I ever do, which is uh, the first visual history of life in Antarctica from prehistoric times to the present day. I've been to Antarctica several times and uh, my very first big one-man show at the Natural History Museum in LA was 45 paintings depicting both prehistoric Antarctica and contemporary Antarctica. So lots of stuff to look forward to, folks. Yeah, we can't wait. So do you, do you happen to know off the top of your head like what your booth is, booth number? Um, booth number, no. It's the same place it is every year. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, before we let you go, sure. And thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're why don't you tell <laughs> why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you on the internet? Oh sure. Uh, it's pretty easy. My website's www.williamstout.com. And I'm also on Facebook. I have two different Facebook pages, a, a regular page and then a fan page. So I'm pretty easy to find, pretty easy to get a hold of. Uh, to most people's amazement, I'm actually listed in the phone book because that's how I get work. <laughs> you know, I, I can't hide. I need to. I need to have those potential clients find me. That's amazing. I love that. Okay, well, we can't wait to see you at Comic Con this year, and thank you so much for joining us. We really You're appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks for having me as a guest on your show. It's a wonderful show. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we're gonna let you Thank go. You. And then we are gonna have Bud Plant join us here in just a second. Okay, say hi to Bud for me. He's one of my oldest, dearest friends. He's a super oh. guy. <laughs> he, he is really nice. I got to talk to him for a while over the weekend. Yeah. He's lovely. Yeah. yeah, one of the nicest right. guys in the business. Yes. Thank you All so right. much. All right. Thank you. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's see. I, th I think William Stout is one of the nicest guys in the business. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, I, I just constantly want to hug him. I mean, that, that's just all there is to it. I just love the guy. That was so cool. He was super nice. And that Kong Skull Island poster sounds amazing. I can't wait to see that. I know. That should good. be good. Should be good. good. All right. So we are just waiting for Bud Plant to join us, which should be any minute. But while we wait, James, you want to talk to us a little bit about how amazing Galaxy's Edge was? <laughs> uh, there is not <laughs> enough time between when now and when he's going to join us for me to talk about Galaxy's Edge. That's fine. That's fine. Do we want to All take right. a couple quick reader questions? Sure. Um, right. yeah, if you have a question, just uh, go ahead and send us it in. But um, I will say Galaxy's Edge is amazing. Uh, it just, it's just amazing. I mean, and I didn't even get to do a little piece of all the things that you can do there. I mean, there's a ride, there's some shops, there's the cantina, all amazing. But there's also just, you can just walk around and talk to people and hear stories. And every cast member has a version of a story that they have helped contribute to, to be a part of Batu in the Star Wars universe. And, you know, I mean, it's just... Oh, and, and uh, uh, Eric says uh, that he's heard some mixed things about Galaxy's Edge, heard it's expensive. Yes, it is expensive. Um, if you want to buy anything, of course it's expensive. It's Disneyland. And it's a little bit more than normal Disneyland. But technically, because they're free uh, reservations right now, um, you, can, uh, you can go and not spend any money if you don't want to buy any food or merchandise. I mean, honestly. Uh, you don't have to spend money unless you want to unless you want to buy some food and stuff. Yeah, but well, what's the point? I mean, have the even yeah. Disney in, in general like half the enjoyment is the is the eating and the drinking. So, but not half. Okay, I'm gonna maybe a third of the enjoyment. Um, but we got we got to go on uh, the Falcon twice on our first day uh, because it got down to a five minute wait. So all of those uh, people thinking that that massive line in the beginning was gonna mean that there was lines everywhere it didn't happen um because everyone was basically told to go on once and then um once the line died down after that initial rush then it, you know if it was short enough you could go on twice and we did but then 
after going on after a five minute wait, uh, the ride broke down and we got stuck in the in the Falcon for twenty minutes. Oh and, boy! Yeah, and then um, we had to get taken off on one of those. You know, uh, had to bring out one of those mobile stairs, and then we walked around and, and had to exit backstage, which oh is boy. cool. But you know, there goes twenty minutes plus of your uh, four hour limit that you have in the land during this time. Um, but uh, it was still amazing. We got to see how the rides were designed, which um, if you've seen behind the scenes of Solo and how they filmed them in the Falcon, you know how the ride was built. Hmm. So if you ever are curious, go look that up. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but one yeah. of the I had one question for you based on some of the photos that I had seen is that it it looked like they weren't packing the place completely. It, it looked like there was room to move around and room to take pictures in the, in the land in general. So I, I, I was wondering if that was the case for, for your experience too. Absolutely. Um, with the exception of Ogus Cantina, which they fixed after the opening weekend, and the Millennium Falcon ride at initial opening and then Savi's workshop with the, uh, the lightsaber building, there really were no lines anywhere. I mean, the longest line we waited in, and that was on purpose, was the Millennium Falcon when it was 30 minutes. Um, otherwise, we could have just waited for the 5 to 15 minute um, time limit. Um, Savvy's we never went to because we're not, uh, we don't want to pay the $200 to build a lightsaber yet. At some point in the future, we might, but right now we didn't want to. Same thing with the droid building. We do want a droid probably at some point, but it's like $100 and we didn't want to spend our money there. We wanted to spend our money on other things. Um, and those things aren't just, you don't just go in and buy right item either. It's like, it's an experience, right? Yes. You get to, I mean, the droid workshop is amazing. If you saw fo uh, photos or a video of it, it's like they've got droid legs and things going around on a, on a thing above you. And they have, you know, bins where you can pull out the, droid parts you want and all that kind of stuff. And in, in Savi's workshop for building the lightsaber, you have the station and then there's these, the cast members are these like historians of lightsaber lore who help you build your lightsaber according to what kind of person you are. And it's, it's all, every single aspect of Star Wars land is immersive. And I know that people think that, you know, having price tags on things and, Every once in a while, a regular Disney cast member will be actually walking through there. Um, and that stuff's unavoidable, like security and such. You, can, you, can't, uh, you can't get away from that. Um, plus, it was opening weekend and, and opening day, and I think they kind of wanted to make sure that everything was going fine. But when you talk to the people that are selling you something, or you go find one of the characters, like a stormtrooper or a First Order officer, or uh, Vi Marathi, the the main resistance spy, um, it's all in character. You know, money's not money, it's credits. Um, if you are getting a discount because you have an annual pass, they're basically like, uh, we won't tell Hondo that we gave you a discount because Hondo is the one who runs Black Spire Outpost, basically. That's amazing. I mean, everything has a story. You know, if you ask someone where they're from, they're going to tell you what city on Batu they're from if they're not from, you know, near Black Spire Outpost or if they traveled from another planet. They're like, oh, I used to live on Corellia but I moved here, you know, I, I finally got out of Corellia because I just wanted to go to a desert planet instead of an industrial planet or whatever it may be. They all have stories. But let me answer a few questions from uh, this the chat here. Um, how do they handle the time limit? You get a colored wristband and at the end of your four hours, if they see you with that wristband, that's the wrong color for the time frame, they ask you to leave. Um, we actually stayed an extra half hour waiting for someone to ask us to leave and no one ever did. Uh, because we were just standing around not getting in line for anything or trying to buy anything. If you tried to get in line for something, um, they usually like, no, you can't get in line. Like if you tried to go ride the Falcon again, it's like, no, your time's up. You got to go. Um, so, I mean, it was fine. And it never felt crowded. I mean, they overlap with an hour after that first initial thing. So um, that overlap, there's double the amount of people in there. And then the Falcon will fill up again to another over an hour again. But then it goes right back down after an hour or so. Um, what type of camera do I use? Uh, we shoot with a Canon uh, 5D Mark III, um, which I haven't posted any of those photos that I've taken with that yet, but we use mainly all phone photos for the first couple of days. Um, but that's what we use at Comic-Con as well. And um, let me see if there's any other questions. 
I don't see any that uh, that I had to answer right there. So, what other questions does anyone have for uh, Galaxy's Edge? Um, the Millennium Falcon ride smells like a mechanic shop when you walk through the queue. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, the uh, app that you use, the Disney, uh, the Play Disney Parks app, it turns into a data pad, and you can take jobs and scan things and hack things. And once the reservation period is over, I am going to be doing that every time I go because it just is full of things to do. And it expands the universe and immerses you in it. Like uh, on the way out on, on, our, on Saturday, um, I had been hacking panels and droids. And then on the last panel before we were exiting, it asked me uh, like a, another, a character came up on the chat thing and said, hey, I got this skimmer if you want it. And I'm like, a skimmer, what's that? You know, they actually, it's a multi, it's a choose your own adventure kind of thing in the game. And I, I asked what it was. And it's like, well, if you install this on a, on a panel early in the day, and then before you, before one of the sides wins, because all the panels are like being hacked for the resistance or the first order, before one of the sides wins, if you go back to that panel and collect your skimmer, you get all the credits that people have earned that day. So you get more money and like i and if you if you drive the falcon ride and your phone is on for the bluetooth thing you get the credits that you earned when you did a job for hondo on the millennium falcon ride so i mean everything is connected in this park like all the way it's really cool that's amazing as far as the credits you can earn uh, iron souls asked if you can use those in the land i have no idea i think it's just so you can buy things like because i had to pay for the skimmer to the to the guy who was trying to sell it um and uh, Andrew says the stores are small. Yes, the, all the stores are pretty small, um, but most of the stores on the market are just that. It's a market. You can just walk from one to the next. And none of them ever had more than about 10 people in line or so, I think, for the most part. The food does, but use the mobile ordering in the Ronto wraps and the uh, milk stand. Just use the mobile ordering. We actually ordered on mobile ordering on Saturday before we even got into Star Wars land and had it ready for us when we got there. Oh. So it was awesome. Do you want to do you want to show us what you bought? Uh, oh yeah, I bought um, hmm. this Ahsoka doll back here, um, and then we bought this Loth cat. If you pet him, he meows or purrs, which is awesome. And then we got this bag here, and then we have like stuff that I can't show in here because it's big. And we have like Black Series toys and and uh, the Ahsoka lightsabers, which I'm actually gonna get rid of because uh, there's a little scratch on them and I want a fresh set because I bought the display model and I didn't realize there was scratches on it. So I got to get a new set because I want to have those nice pristine ones and I'll, I'm hoping a cosplayer gets them. Um, so they can, you know, they're gonna break, they're gonna use them and break them anyway at some point. So yeah. I might let them go to someone who's gonna actually use them. Um, and we just picked up a few random things, bought some stuff, you know, for, for my wife's uh, family and uh had a general good time and we're going back which is awesome how soon are you going back thursday oh boy yeah yeah we got in on a, a friend of ours uh it's her birthday and she put us on her reservation which was awesome so nice oh there yeah. go oh that's great yeah but no there's so many awesome things there and just walking around i mean and it's all built out it's not like you know if you go on some of the rides in the land like you can feel the, um, like it looks like stone, but you feel it and it feels like hard plastic. Um, it's all cement. I mean, oh. it's, it's built out of actual, like this was actually constructed to look and feel like it had been there for hundreds of years. And there's blaster holes and things. Things look like they've been burnt a little bit. There's corners of buildings that are crumbling and you can see the pieces of the brick that it was made with. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's so cool. But apparently, uh, Carrie is, is still working on getting Bud uh, logged in. So uh, we will keep going, I guess. I don't know how much more I can talk about Star Wars Land. Really? Forever. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I don't think we've hit your limit yet. Um, the Falcon ride, uh, I, I know some people have also said that that was so-so, but I, I thought it was just amazing because... You do have to do things like, you know, if you're the pilot, you have to, you know, one side steers left and right and the other side steers up and down and also does hyperspace. And then one of them does the, the boost or the brakes. And uh, the second row of people, the two gunners, they are the ones who shoot things down like TIE fighters and stuff. 
And then the final row is the engineers and they handle like uh, latching onto the cargo and keeping the ship up and running when you crash into things because the pilots crash into a lot of things because obviously you haven't played it very much. Um, and it's basically like a, a giant video game that you're playing in Star Wars. Um, but I was the pilot once and the gunner twice. Uh, and I just enjoyed all of it. Um, even though we did crash a lot on our last time on uh, the one time we went on Saturday, we did so horribly and we actually had a different result at the end than we had the previous two times. So there can be different mm -hmm. things that happen just like star tours. We did so poorly that, um, Hondo, uh, chastised us in his little video message at the end before you exit. And he's like, uh, you know, he was telling us that, you know, all the things that were broken. Um, so, yeah, we, we did not do very well. Has anyone reported about how many different endings, possible endings or combinations there could be? I don't think so. I mean, we only got two different ones because I think we did about the same the first two times. We did okay, not great. Um, so, and no, it's not the Kessel Run. It's a whole new job. Um, you're just going to steal coaxium from Corellia. Uh, you just go there, you do the job, and you get out. And that's what the and how well you'd get in there and steal and then get out is how many credits you earn. Um, and uh, did Hondo call you a nerf herder? Uh, no, I don't think he does. I don't remember. I haven't seen. I mean, you'd think I would remember that, but no, he does use a few Star Wars lingo's like you know, I have a good feeling about this, bad feeling about this, that kind of thing. He does that, um, but uh, and Iron Soul says there's only one mission for now. Yes, there's only the one mission, and they probably, as he says, they're probably going to add more missions later this year or in the future. They'll keep adding more, but it, within that one mission, like I said, there's different results that you can have. Um, Iron Souls also asked, uh, "Did you choose green milk or blue milk?" That is an interesting question because there are actually two different blue milks. There is the one in Ogus Cantina and the one at the milk stand outside. Um, and the one in Ogas is more of a thick milk type drink. And that one is very good. Uh, someone described it as melted rainbow sherbet, which is roughly what it tastes like. It's a little, it's not very strong flavored, but it is, it is yummy. Um, on the ones outside, the yellow, uh, the blue and the green milk, those are both more like slurpy slushy kind of things they're iced drinks and the blue one is actually less flavorful than on the inside of ogas and the green one tastes better so green milk is better than blue outside blue milk is better than both inside ogas and if you mix the two together which a cast member recommended one of the residents of batu when as they were walking by when they saw i had both in my hand i was walking like this um they uh they said mix them all right, so when we got down to a little bit of left of each, I mixed them both, and they were, yes, it was tasty. Um, inside Oga's, yes, we had uh, we had the, we, it was a breakfast time, so at first we're like, let's have breakfast. So we got the Mugen tea and the overnight oats. Uh, the Mugen tea is uh, unsweetened tea and chocolate milk and vanilla and cinnamon, and it sounds kind of weird, but it tastes really good. And the overnight oats was good, but then we had, the Yub Nub uh, indoor tiki mug drink, which is alcohol, and then the Rancor beer flight, which four kinds of beer where the cups are Rancor teeth. Um, all good. I didn't like all the beers, but I don't like all beers, so that was pretty much expected. Um, so uh, some of our friends got the uh, Bespin Fizz, which was this little red drink that the top of it was like all... Uh, foggy and, and bubbly. It was really cool. Hold on just a second. We can hear you too. Oh, good. That's exciting. Can you hear, Karen? Yes. Um, I hear you. Okay. Excellent. All right. So now we have audio of. 
Okay. Well, you just got cut off after audio of. Yes, I, I, I was waiting for Carrie, but she's she's uh, muted, so oh, okay. Carrie isn't going to say anything. But this is just me. This is James. Uh, who am I speaking to? Because Carrie was I the did. one previously talking to this you. This is Anne. Anne? I'm, Hi there. I'm Bud's technical support person. Ah, okay. And Aaron, Aaron can, around can we lot. hear you? Can you hear me? I can uh, hear both. I can, I can hear, hear you. Both. Oh, Aaron. Aaron, uh, we can hear Aaron. So okay. I don't think, uh, Carrie needs to call into Aaron because I think she can hear us since you called it into me. So I think we're good to go. Okay. But Aaron, uh, Carrie wants your cell. Okay, got it. All right. So we're about ready to hopefully get run, up and running with uh, with Bud, right? I hope so. Okay, cool. I was I was rambling on about Star Wars Galaxy's Edge that I went to this weekend. So that's what I was doing to to fill the time between William and and Bud. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm still staring at a screen that Toki selects a while but doesn't show me anything to click. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah, we've been having a lot of problems with Hangouts in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, everything works fine on Sunday. Yeah. But then when I tried it earlier today, we could see Bill Stout. Okay, so I think that we are all actually on, right? Okay, do you want to hand the phone to Bud? We think everybody can hear us? Yes. Okay, then let's do this. All right, I'm giving the phone to Bud. Okay. Hi, Carrie. Hey, Bud, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. <laughs> Never not fun when technology is involved, right? No, not at all. Uh, how things go with Bill? Good, good. Yeah, and he said to say hi, by the way. He said that you are one of the nicest people he's ever met. Oh, yeah. Well, I say the same about him. So following up after him, I don't know. <laughs> if I can measure up, but we'll see. I'm not a famous artist. I think you're going to be just fine. Uh, I, this is <laughs> this is James. Uh, I am also on the uh, podcast here, and as well, Aaron is here as well. Hi, James. Hey there. Hi, Aaron. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Hi. Hi. You're a little soft, Aaron. Oh. Hi. Your instead. How's All right. That? So that good? we're. I think what we are. We do everything. So okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so you've been there along with uh, Bill Stout and three other people. You have been to every Comic Con since the very first one. Uh, what what right. what are your memories of that very first year like? Well, um, <laughs> they're pretty vague after. Uh, <laughs> 48 years of, of not just going, but exhibiting, too. Um, but um, we went down, um, four of us, in a, in a car to San Diego, and um, and uh, remember the, the sort of dimly lit basement of the, I think it was the U.S. Grand Hotel. Um, and um, my buddies and I shared, I think, an eight-foot table and piled it up with comics and then went off and wandered around the show looking for looking for comics for our collections. That, that sounds like uh, a normal thing for for people to do. They go to Comic Con, yeah. Um, yeah, well, this was the old days, so I, I don't think it was more than what did Bill tell you, two or three hundred people there. Yeah, I think like the that? I think the official count that they've said is about three hundred people attended that very first Comic Con. Yeah, so it was a pretty small event. We've been to um, let's see, we've been to Houston the year before in nineteen sixty nine. Um, so this would have been like the second comic book show we we'd ever been to because they really they really weren't around. I mean the they, they had a shows in New York for um several years, but that was at that point that was too far away. But we actually did go to New York um, um um that same year. Um we sojourned back and went to Oklahoma City and then on to New York and did those shows. So San Diego we always call it San Diego, so you have to continue with it at Comic Con. Um it was sort of a like a small regional show compared to even Oklahoma City or New York, but at least it was in our state, so it was great. Yeah, that's that, funny. As someone who lives, as someone who actually lives in Oklahoma City, that's funny. <laughs> that's cool. Well, the the big the biggest comic book conventions back then were really um um they were shared. Um, well, New York was was the biggie. That was the mecca. Um, mm -hmm. 
equivalent of like Luca would be there's a Luca convention in Italy or Angoulême today, but this would be a European convention. So, and New York, um, that Phil Soon was putting out was the big mecca back then. But Oklahoma, um, Dallas, and Houston were the, they would sort of trade off every year. Um, and they were sort of, they were just a little bit more developed, basically, than, than San Diego. San Diego, you know, got off to a little bit of a slow start, but, you know, look what's happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's been designed for itself in the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So when I was talking to you over the weekend, you told me something which I didn't know, which is basically that your own business started roughly the same time as Omicron. So why don't you talk a little bit about Bud's artwork? So what was the idea behind that? Well, um, I had gotten, we, we, we started, to, my buddies and I lived in San Jose at that time, or in the vicinity of the about the area, and we actually had a uh, started a comic book shop in 1968 um, in March, um, and six of us got together and kicked in, you know, what little money we had, and bought a couple months worth of rent on a store downtown. So we we had gotten into the business, so to speak. Um, I was still in high school, and in fact, I don't even think I had a driver's license. I used to have to take the bus down after wow. after school. On weekdays, but we, we, you know, we got this little comic shop going, and we were just selling um, old comics, and I think maybe some paperbacks, some science fiction paperbacks, and we we sort of went through that, and then one of the guys, his mom, decided this was a great career path for him. He's a little older than the rest of us, and so she bought the store from us, and um, uh, shortly thereafter, really, and then in um, um, 1969, I just mentioned we'd gone to. Um, to the show in um, Dallas or Houston? It was Houston. Houston, Houston, yeah. Yeah. We went to the Houston show. Again, there was four of us, um, my buddies and I, and we um, we ended up buying a whole load of comics at the end of the show from somebody who came back to San Jose and um, said, oh, well, we, we should open another comic shop. That would be fun. So we opened up our second comic shop in 69. Um, and then, um, basically, I graduated from high school in 70, and um, I signed up, you know, for college and signed up for a terrible <laughs> load of 18 units and said, man, I don't think I can be running the comic shop and, uh, uh, and going to college full-time at the same time. At that point, um, John Barrett and I were with his own partners. We bought the other two guys out. So um, uh, we closed up the comic shop, basically. Um, and um, then I discovered, oh, I, I, it's really nice to have income coming in and, you know, <laughs> ability to go out and buy comics and, and do other things like an adult. So I said, well, I should do something. Well, okay, I'll start a mail order business. And instead of going into whole comics like a lot of people were, I, I was back on the um, um, the edge of the underground publishing mecca, which was San Francisco and Berkeley. I mean, San Jose is only 40, 50 miles away. So um, I said, well, I'll start doing um, fanzines, comic fanzines, and any books that I can find about comics, which were really few and far between, and um, underground comics. And basically, I started figuring those up. And one of the big events was a whole bunch of those, and then going off to the, the conventions, including San Diego, I would have had underground comics. Whatever fancy I can get a hold of, Spotrot or Spotron, or play some comic dumb with um, Corbin. Corbin was just getting a start back then. And I might set up those on my table and, and sell them. I mean, that, and that's how really the business started. And I started building up a, a list of names and started sending out, you know, first newsletters and then little mini catalogs for people. Do you think that finding a niche like that has helped in letting the business run for 50 years? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and getting out to the conventions was, I mean, to, again, using San Diego as an example, um, but um, meeting meeting the people, you know, meeting fellow collectors, and, and sort of it was great. It's like it's like like sharing. To me, it's like sharing parts of your collection. I mean, every collector wants to have somebody come over and admire their you know their acquisitions, you know, and especially those scarce things that they haven't seen before. And that's sort of like what it was, you know, when I was setting up a, a table. But you know, like like again, you know, at Comic Con, I go down there and. Once I started growing, I have I had my own table and then a couple tables, tables, and I bring out all the new stuff. And, and distribution system being what it was, people just hadn't seen a lot of this material. 
of the fanzines were, you know, just small productions and they were only available by mail and underground comics would come out and I was right on top of the situation because they were so close by. Um, and I was getting to know the artists and the writers and, um, and I could, you know, bring all that stuff to the show and sort of unveil it, you know, and, and it made me sort of different from the, the typical guys who were they said, again, basically selling uh, comics. It wasn't, it wasn't really an artist alley to speak of back then. I mean, um, everybody was just sort of, you know, winging it, you know, trying yeah. to figure out what to, what to do and just wanted to be, be there and meet some artists, meet some famous yeah. people. And you were actually an exhibitor at the first SD, SDCC, is that correct? I'm not catching that. I can't hear you. Oh, we were, were is that a little bit better? better? Yeah. A little bit better. Ask the question again. Uh, and you were one, one of the exhibitors at the first, first SD, SDCC? Yeah. Yeah. And you were, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were one of the, um, you, you exhibited every year until... 2018 was it? That is correct. Um, yeah, last year I finally threw in the towel. Um, what I did is I just got, I got bigger and bigger. And at one point I was actually considered one of the major attractions down there. I had 10, 10 booths, um, which was really huge for, for, you know, yeah, it was at San Diego before, you know, Marvel started setting up and DC started setting up Paramount and the movie studios and stuff before the present day. So back at, back as far as the, the old style show, you know, I was one of the attractions. You know, I don't say that immodestly, but people used to meet at, you know, meet at my booth and go, oh, I'll, I'll see at the show, I'll see on Tuesday afternoon at the plant school, you know, that sort of thing. And so, um, um, you know, we got, we got pretty major down there. Um, we, were, we were actually going so far as the we have a semi the trailer at our warehouse and we palletize pallets and stuff and um, drive a, a drive a van down there and fly people down there. We have a staff of ten or eleven people. Um, sort of similar to what maybe Stuart Ng does now, except it's about twice as large as what as what Stuart has. I think Stuart has five five boots or so. Um, yeah, we you know got to be pretty <laughs> pretty busy down there and then things Starting in 2008, things started sort of taking the other direction. There just didn't. The internet later on, you know, we just started starting seeing seeing business sort of go away, and so I got smaller and smaller and <laughs> like. 2017, I was down to uh, literally a table, and I finally said, you know, it's just it's way more logistical work to do this than it's really worth. I think I'll just throw in the towel and, and say I've got a good 48-year run, and, and that's that's it. Well, that's that's kind of uh, you know kind of sad to see one of the longtime dealers go. I mean, we also saw Mile High Comics uh, leave after a few years ago as well. Um, do you think there was it was it the proliferation of the studios that really started pushing you guys out, or was it that the uh, the people attending the convention changed? Well, that's 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 hand in glove because you know the studios did bring a different a different people in, um, you know, and the people that are coming in now are honestly I've, I've said it a number of times. It seems like they're a lot more interested in the in the um, the what's going on with the studios and what's going on with the movie stars and going to the panels and seeing famous celebrities. So it's more of a celebrity show and it has sort of a media, kindly called a media circus. Um, and it's less and less of an old school, you know, old boy um, collector's show. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the bigger fish that sort of dropped out, but there's been a lot of the, um, the the traditional comic book dealers that deal in old comics, a lot of those guys have just gone by the wayside and decided it hasn't, it's not worth it to, to set up them. It's honestly the logistics of dealing in San Diego, which is sort of a boring topic, but it's, um, it's, it's real difficult. You know, it's, it, there's so, it's such a massive show that you have to, you know, line up outside and, and wait with a bunch of trucks and 
have to have tasters handle your stuff, and things are sort of out of your control. Whereas if a smaller show, you know, I get my little hand truck out and pull my stuff in and set my booth up, and boom, I'm done. But I'm not at Comic Con. <laughs> it's a whole different yeah. experience. On Sunday night, we, we put all our stuff onto a couple pallets, and then we sit down and twiddle our fingers until the teamsters decide that it's our turn to, to, yeah. to, to carry our stuff out. <laughs> I absolutely uh, remember doing that. I, I exhibited a few years at the con and, and helped run a fan group there. So yeah, we, we definitely did that same exact thing. Um, now yeah. Comic-Con still runs, I think it's almost 20% of their panels uh, feature comic companies, artists, and things like that. But there's that disconnect, like you say, of the people coming in who aren't buying the comics. So do you think that Comic Con is doing what it can with the panels to help keep those people in in the front, you know, in the knowledge of the people that are attending, and maybe help expose them to that? Well, I I think you probably have that correct. They probably are. I mean, I I appreciate the fact that they're really they really do bring a lot of artists in. The Artist Alley is really an exciting place, and they they bring in a lot of guests. Um, so I, I'm sort of an aberration in the whole system, and so are the the, the, the comic book dealers. I mean, we're you can be a comic book fan, you know, and, and actually just go see movies and and not really collect comic books nowadays. And you can watch things on television, and maybe you buy some graphic novels, but it doesn't translate into the old school thing of going to the shows and and digging through boxes of back issues. That's that's the big change. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just means that the audience has changed. A lot of the my my customer base tends to be older older guys that have been collecting for a long time, and um, it really has gotten very difficult to get into Comic Con. You know, with the, uh, the lottery system, and and they don't really have one. One of the flaws I think is that they don't uh, give precedence to people that have been doing the show for a long time. So I've got friends that. Are they either scrabbling to somehow get a ticket from some friend or a pass, or they just sort of get up and go, if I'm not going to go, I'll go to another show instead. Well, you actually, even though you missed last year, you are obviously attending again this year, and you are actually a special guest. Yes, right. Is this your first year to be a special guest? Or yeah, it is. I, I, did get a, I, I did get an ink bottle in, so that, <laughs> that was fun. Um, but th yeah, this is the first year I've ever been a guest. I mean, they yell, they, um, uh, I would have come down anyway, but I would have just walked before. And, and the idea of doing that is really, um, uh, is really unique for me and, and actually really pleasurable to go to, to, to say I can go to this, you know, it's the best comic book show in the U.S., but I don't have to, <laughs> to drag all my stuff down there and be a dealer. I mean, I, I did it for 48 years and that yeah. was enough. And, you know, it's it's fun. I'm just starting to discover the joys of actually being on the other side of the table and being a fan because I'm I'm still a hardcore fan. And, um, now I I'll be able to have a lot more time to to catch up with guys like Bill Stout and and um, the other artists and Sergio Aragon is for his for example. I mean, I know most of these guys, but I usually don't have any time to talk to them because I'm usually right. trying to man my tables and talk to customers and stuff. So my my loyalties are always between do I want to go be a fan and you know go go to the comics and meet my friends and stuff, or do I want to be behind my table and sort of be there for people to come by and introduce myself and try maybe try to get them on my mailing list and get them to become customers? So every year I'm sort of torn apart <laughs> that way. <laughs> but speaking of, well, this year will be a whole new experience. Then, yeah, are you are you gonna yeah? yeah. Are yeah. you actually that that leads me to uh, since you're running a mail order business and you're you're continuing to uh, have product and and sell things, are you going to use these few days where you're not behind the booth to walk around and see if there's any something you may have missed in Artist Alley or something you can pick up to have in your in your online mail order catalog? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were traditionally doing that anyway. I would use I usually bring down my assistant, um, Laganna, who's my, my purchasing, I call her my purchasing manager, and, and she would go out and, and check in with all the artists and find out who's got sketchbooks, and she'd bring back a sample, and we'd sit down and say, okay, do we want to carry this or not? Um, and so we were out scouting for material, 
uh, very fairly seriously through the whole show. And then at the end of the show, um, we we have you know, would have given orders to people, and if they have copies of things, they would actually bring them by, and we'd load them up. And sometimes we'd go home from a from a show with a pallet a half pallet and a half of material, maybe two pallets of material. Some of the publishers like Fantagraphics or John Flesk or um, people like that would. Um, would say, hey, we'll make you a deal. <laughs> we don't want to t- carry this stuff home with us. We'll give you an extra deal, and you can shake it with you and throw it in the back of your truck with the rest of your stuff. And we'll go, sure, that'd be great. And so we we take a lot of stuff home. So I'll just do that on a smaller scale. It'll just be me, because I'm not going to drag Madonna down there, but I'll walk around and, and do my own <laughs> my own scouting and, and, you know, undoubtedly make some deals with people and either, you know, pick them up at the end of the show or I'll just have them ship them. After the show, like um, Dean Eagle, Dean Eagle always has a new Mandy book out every single year, and traditionally he would, um, you know, put the three or four boxes for us and sign them all and cart them over to our booth and we truck them home. So we'll see what happens this year. <laughs> I'll see how much room I've got in the car. Well, actually, I'm not going to have room in the car. That's the trick. They're, the Comic Con people are flying me down there, so I'm going to have to do this all pretty much by remote control and have people ship stuff to me. You certainly sound like about the only dealer who would leave with more stuff than they came with sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, you shouldn't do that, but um, we'd actually go home with less. I mean, even in the old days when we were bringing a lot of stuff, we'd, we'd usually have a, a pallet or two less. If we brought eight pallets, we'd go home with six pallets, and hopefully two of them were, were new material. So you always go home with something you never sell out. Yeah. I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sure curious um, what it means to you to be a special guest. If it's bittersweet, or if you're looking forward to it. Um, no, I'm looking forward to it. It's it's actually, um, yeah, it's, it's very nice. Um, <laughs> it might might be a, a, just a too little too late, but I don't want to be, um, you know. I don't want to be negative about it, so it's it's nice. I mean, it would have been it would have been possibly <laughs> nice if, if when I was slowly getting smaller and smaller, I, I had a little more um, you know feedback from the guys. I mean, they treated me pretty good, so I'm not going to complain. You know, I I know when my Ohio left, they were they were pretty upset about the whole thing. Uh, yeah. But you know, I don't really feel that way. But still, you know, if, if they were really interested in keeping me there, they they might have done a little bit more to. Try to make it. To try to ease my way. I mean, they they started giving us priority when we were trying to line up and, and get into the show, um, and uh, you know, make things a little easier. But like I said, the logistics have always been sort of complicated, and I just sort of got shuffled in with a, a lot of other people for the for the most of the time, and it just got harder and harder to deal with all all of those you know, all of those logistics. Um, so, but you know, it's yeah, it's it's, it's a sort of a treat. It's it's interesting because Comic Fest, which is you know the, the sort of spin-off or something of Comic Con, um, those guys also invited me down as a as a guest, and that's the first time anybody's ever done that. Um, so, oh wow, yes, two in one year. <laughs> yeah, two in one year, amazing. It's a, so it's a new experience for me, and, it, and it's sort of a treat. I did a couple panels at Comic Fest. <laughs> they they're they're not nearly sophisticated as, as uh, the Comic Con people. They just sort of you know at the very last minute. Uh, they said, oh, well, here's your two panels, and you're in charge. <laughs> I, was, I was on the road already, and I had to scrabble around to, to put together like a slideshow presentation, and then I grabbed um, uh, Bill Shelley, who's a, a, a well-known writer of, of um, books on comics, and another friend, Michelle Nolan, and said, please get us here with me, because I don't want to be all by myself trying to put on a panel. I'm not a, I'm not a presenter, per se. I, I sort of... I, I like to stand in the background a little bit more and just put the books out. And if somebody's yeah. interested, then I'll 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 tell them all about it. You know, they won't be able to shut me off. But you know, I, you know, I'm not real good at getting them to any audience. So anyway, it, it worked out fine. And um, I'm doing again two panels, two real panels at, at Comic Con. I think with all stuff going to be on one of them with me, and, then, and that'll be real easy because I can sit there and answer questions. That'll be a lot of fun. It will be fun. I'm looking forward to that. Is one of those panels, uh, Mark Evanier told us, are you going to the panel about the 
folks who attended the first year? Is that one of your panels? Yeah, that's one of them. The other one is something about um, re retailing at, at um, San Diego, which is something I'm sort of getting in with you. I'm not sure how much you or your audience is actually interested in sort of the background of Comic Con, but to to you know traditionally, you know it was it was tended to be the dealers and the dealers room that things would sort of center around, and and that's that's how things have changed. Now it probably really is more centered around the panels and and activities outside of the dealer here. It's not as important for people to actually go out and, you know, walk the aisles as it used to be. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, I met some fun people, though, when they when they used to walk the aisles. Uh, we had, um, uh, I think it was Sam from The Lord of the Rings, the guy that played Sam. He turned out that he was a, a customer of ours and also the player. Oh, nice. uh, and, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we used to have fun celebrity sightings every every so often, but not so much anymore. It doesn't seem like the the, the big stars really want to go out and get mobbed by the by the <laughs> too many people. So well, can you blame stop. them? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't blame them at all. But I just we sort of stopped seeing those guys sort of wandering around the aisles like they used to. You know, they just yeah. I guess they're just so famous they can't they can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. All right. Well, did we have any other questions, guys? I don't. I don't. I don't see any. No. Either. All right. Well, Bud. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, why don't you tell them where they can find you and your store online? Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm really available at um, my. You can you can email me directly because I just got a. It's a small business now. We've only got six or seven people. Um, working up at the warehouse, and um, you know I'm Bud at BudPlant.com, and the business is BudsArtBooks.com. We we actually for years we were um, we started out as just being Bud Plant because it was just me selling yeah. comics, and it was sort of pretentious to come up with a name. So I was just Bud Plant, and then I I got a little more official and became Bud Plant Incorporated when I was in the wholesale business, selling so you know I'm only selling comics to comic stores. And um, and then we went back to being comic, but but plant comic art, which I still prefer. But then we got convinced that comic art might be losing us some potential customers because we were dealing so many art books and graphics books and stuff. And so we changed our name to Bud's Art Books. And that's still a source of <laughs> of question <laughs> amongst <laughs> people. But so we're officially Bud's Art Books on the internet. But I like to think of it as Bud's Art Books. Uh, what I gather from that is Julia's anything. So, all right. Well, Bud, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that we get to see you at Comic Con this year. I hope so too. Yeah, we we, we exchanged phone numbers, so we'll have to get together on the floor, and I won't have to be getting interrupted by customers actually wanting to buy anything. You know? Yeah, it's going to be a whole new world for you this year. Yeah, it should be. A, it should be a lot of fun. I'm. I'm I got. I'm sort of piecing together lunch dates and dinner dates with all these people. And usually at the time it gets dinner time, I'm burnt, burnt out, and all I want to do is go hide in a hotel room for a while. Yeah, so. yeah, I feel that. <laughs> all right, well, thanks a lot. It was been a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you, right, bud. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Adios. Bye-bye. Well, that was fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties aside. <laughs> Man, so I and then I think you might still be like connected to the phone or something. Who, who can't hear who? Nope, I can't hear, hear you. you. Good? Can you hear nope. me? Aaron, can we hear you? I can hear both of you. Yeah, I can hear everybody. It's just Carrie. It's just Carrie. Oh, Let's talk I'm about good. her. I'm good. I'm good now. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that was our. Uh, interview okay, so, uh, Bud, which was that now? Huh? Where'd you say, Carrie? Uh oh, did she? Is she gone again? No, she's there. She's I there. I don't know what she's doing, but anyway. Hi. Sorry. No, my audio yeah. keeps doing weird oh. things oh. again. This is just the night of technical difficulties. Yeah. No. <laughs> um. So that was two of the five people who have attended every comic con since it started. And Which means you've now talked to three of the five because Mark was the first one. Yes. And tomorrow we are going to have on Jackie Estrada, Jackie Estrada who currently works for comic con running the Eisner's 
and yep. we will have her on. And she has also been to everyone, which means we are going to be missing only one person yep. who has been to Comic Con every single year. Is it going to happen? I'm are you going five? I don't five? know. I don't know. I was told we don't even know if he owns a computer. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we just proved it on the phone. Yeah, I know. We figured out the audio thing anyway tonight, so that may happen. We'll see. I don't know, guys. Our uh, our guest schedule for the next however many weeks it is is like pretty much two every time. So good times. <laughs> Do it. Bear, bear with us. We're just yeah, and we've got some good people coming up too. One that I know James is very excited about. I'm not excited about anybody. What are you talking about? I'm you are too. excited. I'm not. Come I'm on, not your head. You are excited. I'm not excited. About anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. I'm trying to stay as as, as calm as possible. You know, trying to. No, yeah, no, we're, we're cool. We're cool here. It's all no, good. We're not cool at all. We're not cool guys. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, not at all. All right, so do we want to... We're just going to wrap this up. Join us tomorrow. We're going to have all of the last week's worth of news, exclusives, yep. offsites, everything that's happened in the last week or however long it's been since our last podcast because it feels like it's been a year because, uh, again, I went to Galaxy's Edge. Um, so, but let's wrap this up with if you still need a badge, there are some contests. Uh, we actually have a few more posted in the last week so you can check out our contest hub on the site yep uh and then i also wanted to mention that if you are a big art person now is for the time to start paying attention to our under the tent section as lots of folks have been opening up their commission list lately and later this week we should actually have a compiled list of everyone who's got that we know of who has their commission list open i'm sure there's more that we don't know but Good and times. if you are one of those artists or you are an exhibitor and you want us to uh, feature your SDCC plans, please send us an email. We would yep. love to, to do so. The yes, attendee we of the week is ongoing every Friday. We uh, have our attendee of the week column. And if you wish to be uh, included as a possible attendee of the week, just go to the site and search for it and enter. Send in your info. And then we should have our first announcement for Prize Mule uh, very soon, maybe even this week with the first round of sponsors. Uh, and then we'll also have the proper PaceyCon announcement this week. Unfortunately, I got our graphic design, design artist hooked on a TV show, so she actually hasn't done anything because of that. <laughs> but uh, as soon as she does, we'll be making the official announcement. Excellent. Uh, so join us tomorrow and every Wednesday for the next five or six weeks. No, it's not every Wednesday. No? <laughs> Sometimes no. it's Tuesday. Sometimes it's not. Like, yeah. Okay. And next week it's Friday. We're going to make you <laughs> in this year. Wait for the tweet. Just yeah. wait for the tweet. We're, we're coming, we're coming yeah. at you at least once every seven days or so yeah. for the next few weeks until Comic-Con. And then we'll do the schedule podcast. And it's going to be awesome. And we're going to have all the news and exclusives and everything. And just join yes. us for whenever we say we're going to be on. Yes, basically. You can also sign up for a newsletter, which, oh, my God, we are actually sending them out weekly. Who, who would have believed? Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Aaron. where can we find more of your work on the Internet? Oh, you can find me on Twitter at Bavarian Aaron. I'm also Instagram Bavarian Aaron. You know. Whatever you choose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carrie, how about you? Where can we find more of you on the internet? This time of year, guys, like, don't even follow my personal Twitter. Like, I'm not on it. Mm -hmm. Just type out the blog Twitter. That's where to find me. <laughs> really? Yeah, James? Carrie, just, just at the blog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just at the blog. Like, that's where I am 24 7. James, where can we find more of your work on the internet? I am everywhere on the internet at Dan Regal, uh, which I actually posted to social media for the first time this weekend because of Star Wars. What? And I will post some more. Um, and uh, also check out geekshotphoto.com for links to all of our social media for my wife and I. And which, speaking of my wife, thank you to Beth, our producer, for editing the show, creating the slides that you'll see tomorrow, and all the other little things that get this podcast done. 
That's right. We are on iTunes. If you'd like to subscribe, the links are up on the blog, or you can search for SD Concast. If you like what you've heard so far, please review us. We are also on Stitcher Radio. The link is in the show notes. And please review us. Guys, no one's have to review in like a year. Uh, you know. So, yeah. But if you want to get a hold of us, besides tweeting at theory, uh, at SD underscore comic underscore con, uh, you can also send us an email at sdcomiccon.blog at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash sdconblog uh, and the aforementioned Twitter. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this special Tuesday edition. And everybody, go, go Trump! Trump!